welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I'm going to be reading the first chapter of today is called Just Lizzie by Karen Wilfred. Lizzie is a 14 year old who has a lot of questions. She is wondering why she had to move to a new house. She is wondering why she doesn't feel the same way as her friends do about boys and flirting. At the start of the book, Lizzie and her family are living in a new neighborhood in a new house. They had to move because of a restraining order that they took out against their neighbor. This situation is something that you learn more about as the book goes on, and Lizzie learns more about it as well. Lizzie's confused about why her family had to move if it was her neighbor who had to stay away from them. And she's not happy in her new house. In addition to being in her new house, her brother, her older brother, her only sibling, is now leaving for college. So she's navigating this new neighborhood and this new house without her sibling, who she's very close to. And that's a big difference, too. She also has to get used to not talking to him every day and has to get used to the way that their relationship might change when they're talking on the phone. And then Lizzie has a lot of questions about why she doesn't want to always talk about boys, always flirt with boys. Why people tell her when a boy is being mean to her, that that just means he likes her. That's confusing to her. And her friends keep prodding her and questioning her as to who she likes, whether it's a girl or a boy. And she doesn't feel she has feelings like they seem to have for anybody. And she wonders what is wrong with her. Lizzie starts to learn about asexuality actually through plants, through a science project. She's learning about how plants grow, how some plants don't need other pollinators to grow. And it starts to make her think about the natural world in general and how if a lot of what she's been told has been omitting something. Lizzie is taking a self-defense class, mostly because of what happened to her mother and the restraining order. The combination of the self-defense class and this messaging about boys hurting you because they're flirting with you really makes a strong point about standing up for yourself and also what the expectations are for gendered behavior and what middle schoolers and teenagers and kids are told about how they should behave based on their gender. So Lizzie's got a lot on her mind and I will now read you the first chapter of Just Lizzie. Chapter one, I hate running that tight feeling in my lungs, the ache in my chest that feels like crying. Plus, running is all about being fast. And if you ask me, things move fast enough as it is. Just two weeks ago, I watched as Dad and James pulled out of the driveway, the car windows packed high with James's belongings in those stackable plastic bins that are supposedly great for dorm rooms. The world felt strange and jumbled. A breeze moved the shadows of leaves around the driveway like a kaleidoscope. My brother, leaving for college. After what happened last spring, Mr. Hankman, the restraining order, the move, I hadn't believed he would really go. This morning, when I came down the stairs in orange running shorts and a tank top, Mom tried to hide her surprise, but she didn't stop me. Going for a run, I felt mature saying. Back at our house, mom would commemorate the first day of school by taking a picture of James and me on the front step with our backpacks and new sneakers. Today is my first day of eighth grade. Do I have to be in a picture by myself? The thought of that when I woke up this morning in a room that still doesn't feel like mine seemed pathetic and sad. So I decided to commemorate the morning my own way. I decided to go back. The sun is still behind the trees now, the sky a faint purple pink, but the air is hot from yesterday with the promise of more heat to come. I want to slow down, maybe even walk, but every house's window feels like eyes casting judgment. Stopped already. Big surprise. Doesn't look very fit. I pick up my pace as I approach the Jacobs's house. Part of me hopes Mr. or Mrs. Jacobs will see me running and be glad they've hired someone so motivated as their babysitter. I look up at the girls' dormer windows. No one there. I always thought a house with dormer windows would be cool. I mentioned that to my family back in June when we started looking for places, but Dad said they were an inefficient use of space. Mom said one of her students had gotten a concussion on a slanted ceiling. 
and James didn't care because Allie had just told him she didn't want to keep dating him when they went away to college. After that, I stopped saying what I thought, but I still like to dream about my house someday. Someone's automatic sprinklers hiss and I jump, but it's too late. My sneakers get sprayed. This neighborhood is a newer development with wooden fences separating square after square of chemical green lawn. No one here has woods. No one here has an apple tree. Our old yard had one set back in a small clearing at the edge of the yard. It dropped mottled green fruit from late summer up until the beginning of October, my birthday. Mom told me those apples were wild and not for eating, but I ate them anyway. Each time I was startled by their bright sourness, the starchy feel they left behind on my tongue. Sarah Nan and I played in the tree, shimmying up the branches to pick the littlest fruits for our American Girl dolls. I always thought of that tree as mine. Technically though, as mom later told me, it's in the part of the woods that belongs to the Hankmans. I hadn't known the woods were anyone's. I thought they were just woods. As the sprinkler water soaks through my skin, I run alongside a stone wall that has rocks set upright like spikes along the cement rim. Who do they think is going to sit there, and why do they care? Maybe our wall should have had spikes. After the wall ends, I turn onto Cedarwood, then Pleasant, then I stop. Dead end. The neighborhood that we moved to, across town from our old one, is an offshoot of the area known as The Maze. The winding, illogical streets are meant to discourage cut-throughs and, as one neighbor told us when she came by with the welcome basket, to prevent home invaders from getting away. She probably wasn't thinking what would happen if the invader lived next door. I stand at the dead-end street, catching my breath. Maybe I should turn back. Maybe I don't need to go all the way there. When we moved, the apples were still hard green marbles. By now, they'll have grown big enough to wrap my hand around, but won't be ready yet for picking. I always felt like that tree knew me, like we knew each other. But after what happened with Mr. Hankman and my mom, I wasn't allowed to go back in the woods anymore. I didn't get to say goodbye. I turn around and try again. I trace my previous path, trying to look like I know where I'm going as I remember the steps. The automatic sprinklers, the aggressive stone wall, the house where the dog jumps out. The dog jumps out, a beagle type that scares me three feet off the sidewalk. No, I say in my best firm voice, which isn't very firm. One time I got bitten by a dog. It was a tall gray one that tugged its owner over to me as James and I were walking home from sledding behind the high school. Someone wants to say hello, the owner said, so I reached out and that dog chomped straight down on my hand. Fortunately, I was wearing mittens, but I could still feel the teeth digging into the soft spaces between my knuckles. Ha <laughs> ha, ouch, I said while the owner said, leave it, and pulled him off. James didn't even realize I'd been bitten until after, when I pulled off the mittens and we saw the skin already turning purple. Lizzie, why didn't you say something, he demanded. He wanted to go back and find the dog walker, but I wouldn't let him. Finally, he sighed and took my sled so I wouldn't have to carry it. As I cradled my injured hand in my opposite elbow, I reasoned, I was the one who reached out, so when the dog bit me, it was my fault. Now that I'm back on track and the barking has faded away, it's easy. A long stretch of downhill sidewalk and I'm out of the maze a block away from Main Street. The traffic picks up as I jog past the cemetery and library and village diner, where James used to take me for waffles on Wednesday mornings when he had first period study hall. At a crosswalk, I get to rest. The telephone pole has a sign taped to it. Wendover Community Center. Registration now open for fall classes. Fall already. Where did the summer go? There's a honk. A car is waiting for me. I wave, though I would rather have waited until no one was there. As I jog across, it feels like that car and all the cars behind it are watching me in my orange mesh shorts. A few more blocks and I'm in a residential neighborhood again. My old neighborhood. Down the hill, around the corner, onto Deerfield Circle, and my feet stop moving. I stand across the street and look. There's our wall with one stone upside down from how it should be. There's our front doorbell that never worked. And there at the edge of the woods is my tree. I'm back, I think. Mom and dad don't know a lot about the family who bought our house. They moved here from Connecticut, apparently. Are they taking care of it? From the outside, it looks the same. In my bedroom window on the second floor, I see the eyelet lace curtains I left behind. 
Sarah Nan and I used to wrap ourselves up in them and declare, it's my wedding day. That was back when I thought everyone got married. A twig snaps overhead. I feel an edge out here in the open and the border of the woods looks farther away than I remember. How can I get back there? I slip into the grove of pine trees that lines our across the street neighbor's sidewalk and peer through the needles. Looks like the new owners have backed a couch right up to the living room window. Who would want to sit on a couch that faces the wall? Connecticut people, I guess. I lean forward to see what else I can make out, but suddenly I hear an engine grumbling down the street, Mr. Hankman's red pickup. I drop to my knees, pressing my back against the tree trunk. Don't let him look over here, I think, as if the tree had the power to hear my thoughts. Don't let him see me. The pickup slows as it takes the curve past my hiding spot, rumbling through the space between my house and me. I hold my breath. Don't look, don't look. I remember the plaid shirt he was wearing that day. I remember his hand on the door, pushing back. The engine fades to a grumble again, turns up the Hankman's driveway, and stops. It's been four months since Mr. Hankman forced his way in our front door. But now, as I inhale the tang of sap and the deeper, browner smell of decomposing bark, I'm right back in that moment, frozen. My heart pounds. A car door slams. I wait for the creak bang of the porch's screen door to tell me that he's inside. And only then do I rise to my feet, knees shaking. Something green glistens by the curb. Cautiously, I part the pine branches and look through. One of my apples? All the way out here? How? Maybe a squirrel. Or maybe it's a gift. Even from here, I can see that it's perfect, smooth, symmetrical, with a fine spray of brown speckles around a tiny dimple in the side. All I need is one seed, then I can have it back. Three, two, one, now, I tell myself. And in one movement, I burst out of the trees, snatch the apple, and take off at a run. I've got pine needles stuck to my socks and hair and shoulders, but I don't stop to brush them off. I don't stop at all, even though my lungs are burning until I'm safely back in the maze. There, I bend over, gasping for breath, the apple still clutched in my fist. I know things can't go back to the way they used to be. My brother was the one who always made sure I was okay, and now he's gone. Strangers have my house, my room, my tree, everything. No part of my home is mine anymore, because in spite of what Mr. Hankman did, he got to stay. We're the ones who had to leave. And that is the end of chapter one of Just Lizzie. You hear Lizzie talking about Sarah Nan in that chapter. Sarah Nan is her best friend and has been since growing up. And Sarah Nan is one of those friends who has a crush and then starts spending a lot of time with him. And so another thing that Lizzie seems to be losing or that seems to be changing in her life is this friendship with Sarah Nan. This is a really great book about speaking up for yourself, about using your voice, to tell people who you are and what you want and about being able to question everything to figure out who you are and what you want. It's also a book about listening and listening as people tell you who they are and what they feel and what they want. And Lizzie is a really great character. She is very real. She is anxious. She worries. She worries about big things. She worries about everyday things and she really sort of gets into your heart. There were some really moving parts of this book, and I highly recommend Just Lizzie by Karen Wilfred. Thanks for joining me.